So do we start? All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I understand that I'm between you and uh, you know the sumptuous dinner waiting for all of us. So, <laughs> so uh, I uh, um, so I, I decided to not make the talk theoretical, but rather drive home the point of uh, how do we bring theory to practice in a field that's um, you know. Uh, requiring a lot of us engineers work very closely with uh, clinicians and oncologists and biologists to bring a lot of predictability in, uh, in diagnostics. Uh, so in, in that theme, uh, I'm going to talk about how do we bring predictability in uh, preemptively detecting lung cancer from the act of smoking or exposure to some kind of smoke. Uh, my advisor is Professor Ravi Iyer here at CSL, um, and I collaborate happily with people at IGB, which is the Genomics Institute in, uh, in our campus, with Professor Derek Wildman and his team. Um, so lung cancer is the number one uh, killer uh, among all cancers. Uh, it's pretty prevalent in all communities all over the world, um, and the problem with this particular cancer is that it has the lowest five-year survival rate. So what I mean by a survival rate is that once the tumor is known and it's diagnosed and it's seen, uh, these patients have only a 20% chance of living for five years. And it's much, much higher in other kinds of cancer, but it's extremely low in, uh, in lung cancer. But what's really even more disturbing is that the therapeutic processes for treating lung cancer are extremely painful and extremely invasive. You've all seen ads of this kind one way or the other in, 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 in TVs, and so I'm not going to go much into the details. But what makes this all difficult is also that there are no preemptive diagnostic methods. If it were there, I would not be talking about it today. And what's also more challenging is um, that the odds of getting uh, or developing tumor in the lungs due to genetic predisposition, which means that if you're carrying a particular kind of a mutation in a gene, and if it's known to be correlated to lung cancer, the odds of getting lung cancer in that particular case is only twice. Uh, compared to when you have uh, exposure to a lot of smoke, then it's 50 times as much that you will develop lung cancer uh, in, in this situation. So, you know, the, the external factors and the kind of, you know, you know, busy life that people live in puts them at a much higher risk of developing cancer. And the bigger problem of all biological problems is that uh, there is no one single biomarker or one particular gene where you can say that, yeah, you know, uh, look at this particular gene in this particular person all his life, and then you will know whether if it's going to, you know, lead to developing, uh, you know, tumor in the lungs or not. And such is the case for all cancers, and this is true even for lung cancer as well. So all of this really uh, puts us in a position where, you know, we need a, a model that can uh, actually look at tumor development in the lungs, and I'm only talking about lung cancer in this particular talk. Um, so a little bit of a biology primer, just to put you all in perspective, is um, that let's say that we get a healthy tissue uh, from, uh, from an individual or from a particular sample, and what happens is that in this tissue, there are a lot of cells which basically contain you know, the whole genome, the whole genome has 24 or 23,000 genes, and the genes are, you know, long sequences of DNA, as you can see, and most of you are familiar with the DNAs. And there are many different kinds of genes that do different things in the body, but I'm only interested in two kinds of genes in the context of cancer. One is called the tumor suppressor genes, which is that they function to, you know, reduce the chances of developing tumor. Uh, that's the colored one that I have uh, here. And then we have oncogenes, which are genes that promote tumor development in, um, you know, in, in, in the organs. And this is the black and white, the gray one, not so interesting looking one. And if for the cell to be healthy, which means that, you know, you don't want the tumor to be growing, then more often than not, you want these tumor suppressing genes to be functioning and active, you know. And the oncogenes need to be suppressed. So then you know that, you know, chances of developing the tumor are much lower. Then, now let's assume that this individual with healthy lungs and healthy cells in his lungs starts smoking and, um, you know, ex gets exposed to smoke for about two to three decades because the tumor development is not instantaneous. It's not that you start smoking today, tomorrow morning, you're going to be in call. But it's going to take quite a long exposure because the body has to start reacting to the amount of smoke that you get into your lungs. And over time, there is a lot of underly uh, underlying biological mechanisms that can lead uh, from a healthy cell to a, uh, to a cell becoming cancerous. And what happens in a cancerous cell is that 
the tumor suppressing genes are no more functioning, but the onco genes are you know very active and happy to to be around, and that's when the cancer cells are formed in the lungs, and they they start proliferating in the sense that they start dividing and then they start taking over the population, and this healthy tissue here gets transformed into something like this when you look at it in 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 in, in, a, in a microscope. And this proliferation, unfortunately, is very quick. You know, it takes two to three decades for these cells to get exposed to smoke. But the moment that you know the chemical reactions are really, really, really aggressive, very quickly the tumors are formed, and that's why you know in this particular case of cancer, the survivability rate is extremely low once it is diagnosed. Okay. Now a lot of people have looked at solving this particular problem, which is that the moment that they know that there is a cancer cell in the population. What is the time to which this population is completely taken over? And you know, then, then it gives people an estimate of how long will an individual live. And this is solved as an evolutionary dynamics problem. A lot of game theorists, a lot of um, you know, statisticians have looked at this. And they model it more or less as, as a generic birth that process and its variance. So this is sort of well understood in the community. But somehow our clinician friends don't seem to accept these models because it does not have uh, any real data backing um, the models. And uh, I, I don't want to, I, I really like these models from a theoretical perspective, but again, theory to practice, there's a big disconnect here. But our real interest is bridging this research gap where we don't really best understand yet what is the mapping between a healthy tissue and the genes that are doing pretty well for a healthy individual that transforms them into becoming cancerous cells and, you know, uh, situations where the tumor can actually start to grow. And how do we model that change? And this is an unsolved problem. And this is the research gap that we are trying to bridge in this work. So when I started looking at this, uh, putting on my engineering hat, I really wanted to understand what's going on with these genes if you look at a population. So if you look at you know, a large population from a given area, what is their biological story all about? right? So this particular data was from Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, which is uh, near Boston. And they had a study of about 100 individuals. And uh, so I looked at this data. And I'll talk to you more about it as we go along. And in here, I looked at the healthy lung. So these are biopsies from healthy individuals. Uh, and we looked at the probability density function to see how the gene expressions are behaving. And in the rest of this talk, I will focus on one particular uh, tumor suppressing gene and one onco gene, just to keep the story simple. And here is how the, 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 the distributions look like. Now, when you look at the, the same um, you know, population's biopsies with the tumor in them, you see that there is a slight difference in the way that the, the distributions are for the same gene when they are exposed to the smoke and when they actually have the cancer proliferated in those, in those samples. right? So you see that the tumor suppressing genes, their expression levels have come down because the peak has moved. And the same thing for the onco genes, you would see that the expression levels have gotten higher. right? Now, when, when I looked at this for a while, I started looking at the other genes to see if there was similar behavior. And it turns out that nobody really knows that if there is a threshold where for each and every gene you can say what is the tipping point where the genes will basically aid in tumor development. So such a thing is not yet known. But what we all and what the, all the biologists will very happily agree with is that the effect of the aggregate you know, gene expressions of the onco genes, if it overwhelms the effect of the tumor suppressing genes, then cancer proliferation is very highly likely to happen. So that's when I said, oh, well, you know, I see some sort of a competing model here where there are two kinds of genes that are trying to fight the situation. Why don't we model this as a game? And that's where I bring in um, you know, a notion of game theory in, in this work. Okay? So the game here is as follows. And I will uh, try to explain what the game is in our biological context by connecting it to something that the textbooks teachers, and I'm not married, so I don't really know why this game is so popular. But um, this is the battle of sexes, where in a game you have players. It's a husband and a wife happily married. Uh, at least the books claim it. And, and in, in, uh, in the biological world, we have the players as the onco genes and the tumor suppressing genes, because they are uh, you know, uh, the, the key players of uh, the, the, the cancer in, in our work. And these players have some strategies. You know, in this husband and wife case, you know, they have an option to either watch a football game or go to a symphony. And in, in our uh, uh, problem, the, um, the strategies are whether if this, uh, the genes will let them 
uh, let this tissue, uh, let, let the sample be healthy or uh, support the tumor formation. And when they pick these strategies, uh, the payoff for the husband and wife is how happy they are, right? I mean, look, if they are, if they, if they are together because they are uh, happily married, then they will be happier if they, uh, you know, individually go to either watching the symphony or uh, the, uh, the football game. And the solution concept to understanding this game, as our previous speaker said, is uh, in this particular case, you can look at a Nash equilibrium where if there's a strategy in an equilibrium, then unilaterally changing your decision will put you in one of these cases, and so you will not be as happy as you are if you choose any one of these pairs of options, right? And then there are different ways of picking what kind of equilibrium solutions you want because you can have multiple solutions, and there's also a notion of like, yeah, if I don't want a strict, uh, if I don't want a pure uh, Nash equilibrium, then you can derive a probability distribution over the strategies to say, okay, I'm going to play this strategy with a 60% chance and another strategy with a 40% chance and so on. So those are also very interesting models that we, that we have considered in this work. Um, but coming back to our biology problem, here the payoff that I will talk a bit more in detail in the next slide is what is the gene expressions or the totalitarian of these gene expressions that can contribute towards these genes being either playing the, uh, the, the tumor role or playing the, uh, the healthy role in this particular context, right? So the payoff is this, uh, you know, sort of ugly looking map, but um, I'll, give it, I'll give you the interpretation of this with an example so that it all sticks in our mind. So let's say that we have a new patient who comes into the hospital and uh, we are still looking at the same two genes, the DAP uh, K1 and the KRAS. And this particular patient, when he comes in, you know, we look at their blood measure and then we say that, you know, the gene expression of DAP K1 is 1500 and the KRAS is 500. So what does it mean now in the context of what we already know in the population is as follows. So this is the game matrix that we will fill up. And we already knew these distributions from our population study. So now we will look at, uh, you know, what does a 1500 of DAP K1 on a healthy population data correspond to in its probability? And then what is its supporting uh, hypothesis for this particular game where I will say that, you know, the, the, the gene expression gets weighted with how likely is it that this expression value is explaining whether if this expression value is healthy or tumorous, and then we populate this data. And in theory, we can add more and more genes with this nice summation property that we have, but in the example here, I'm just showing it for one particular pair of genes. Now, when I look at this, you will see that these two pairs have slightly higher numbers that's very similar to the husband and wife game or the battle of sexes game that we had. And the question is, which of these do I pick, right? Because now I have two solutions, what do I pick? Now, one version of the work that I'm going to show about is where we only pick the NAS solutions that maximizes the payoff for both the players compared to all of the solutions that are there in the matrix. And so in this particular case, I would say that this individual is healthy because both of these genes are putting the, uh, you know, expression levels in a spot where uh, it corresponds to uh, the person being healthy because of looking at the population data. So as much as we know about the population, we are trying to you know, individualize this as much as we can using the individual's uh, measures. So in order for the model to be tested, we looked at uh, real data because biologists and clinicians uh, really like engineers doing really amazing theoretical work, but they will really ask, well, does it work on my patients or can I use it in my hospital? Otherwise, they would be like, yeah, you know, we would rather just, you know, let the patient develop the tumor and we'll do the biopsy and take care of him when he comes in. So it's an insurance problem then. So in this particular case, just to tell our clinician's friend that this model is plausible, we looked at 107 uh, human lung tissue uh, biopsies. So these were slightly invasive, but in the future we can measure them with uh, the blood using the mRNA measures, which is essentially the same thing. Uh, about half of them were healthy, half of them were labeled tumorous. All of these, um, you know, 107 individuals were from the same population. I, I don't remember where they are. I think they're from Detroit, I believe. And they relatively had the same living environment, same environmental conditions, economic conditions, and so on. So they have lived more or less in the same situations. And in the actual model for which I'll show you the results, we looked at uh, six genes, three in tumor suppressors and three in oncogenes because we wanted to show that this is somewhat significant since there's no single biomarker, as I said. We know that these six genes are known to be differentially expressed or showing this funny behavior in the tumor samples and the healthy samples in more than 50% of all known lung cancer cases that are reported. So this, this data is from all known 
uh, lung cancer cases that you can find on cancer.org or in government databases around. So this was a fairly well-vetted set of genes. Uh, and in order for me to know um, how good or how bad was the best strategy that gave the, that maximized the payoff, I said the quality of prediction will be the ratio of the payoff from the, 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 maximum, uh, the maximum payoff from the uh, you know, many NAS solutions we have to the sum of all payoffs that of the, of the strategies which are in NAS. So that just tells me how much more better was the payoff in that strategy that I chose compared to all others which were also in NASH. And um, our model gave us 94% accuracy, and here is how it looks like, right? So um, when, what I mean by accuracy here is that we, we looked at, we developed these distributions, and then we took the data of these individual samples, we stripped the, the label, we let the game, uh, you know, look at the data, and then it gave us the, uh, the NASH that maximized the uh, NASH solution that maximized the payoff. And then we said that, yeah, that, that could be the label of that particular sample. And in that case, we, looked, uh, we found that 94% of these samples were correctly uh, labeled, uh, and the, the diagonal ones will basically tell you that uh, these are the samples that are correctly labeled. And uh, we had a reasonably small number of false classification. Uh, and the false classification is where when the distributions of a couple of these genes are extremely close, so the divergence is not a whole lot. And then there's a region of uncertainty that's very close. So it's not very clear by just looking at that gene whether if a sample is tumorous or not. So that's where we, we found that these false predictions were, were lying or coming from. And the same people who did this um, study also came up with a model that said, well, can I just build a classifier or a machine learning uh, method that can classify the samples based on cross-validation and all those great things that we do? And they say that it's about 83% accurate. So we found that, well, this was doing a good 10% better than uh, what's already being published. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the best out there yet, but I think this is heading in the right direction. So when our clinicians looked at this, they said that, well, this makes sense because now I can start to, you know, give a rank to a particular patient and say that, yeah, you know, he's like in this percentile of the population that's at very, uh, you know, higher risk of, you know, needing intervention or not. And so uh, they were willing to accept the model at least until um, this, this extent. But given that I know this works, now the question is how do I bring in a notion of time? Because this model doesn't have a notion of time, right? So in order to bring in a notion of time, and I'm not going to go into the lot of details of this in the interest of uh, you know, a few more minutes to dinner, but um, essentially what we are doing here is that we are, we are modeling this as a Markov chain, much like one of our speakers spoke uh, earlier, where we begin at a particular stage where you know, the individual is young and you know, starts smoking, and then the, the states of this model are basically the, the health of the lungs, which is the, is, is the, is the is the sample healthy, is the lung at risk, or you know, is there already a tumor in the, in the lungs? And the, the, the transition probabilities will come from the game when I look at the mixed solutions. And I didn't talk about the mixed solutions before, but here is where we draw the probabilities, and then we fix them here as to see which state will this particular individual land in. And once the individual lands in a, in, in a tumor state for the first time, we will start introducing a notion or a state called a terminal event or a terminal state where, you know, that's the kind of the tumor stages where in a stage four or stage whatever that's called where the individual has almost 0% chance of living. And this gives us a notion of understanding what is the time uh, if a person starts here and then we, we understand how the gene expression changes, what is the time that they will land up in one of these terminal states. Uh, but unfortunately, while the model is found in its math and we can do cool things, we don't have the data for it to show uh, a whole lot of things. But what I was able to do was that I know what a tumor sample looks like, and I know what a healthy sample looks like. So this is the starting point of the healthy sample, and here is you know the approximate gene expressions of a tumor sample. And I just let you know the expression values decay for uh, the tumor suppressors and the expression values grow for the, uh, the onco genes, just so that I know, you know, can I, can I come up with something interesting if I generate this sort of a longitudinal data? And now when, you, when I had this data, I put it in this model, and then now I was asking the question, what's the time to an absorption state or a terminal state? And you see that, you know, this curve kind of drops down, and of course there are some outliers here because of numerical instabilities, but most of these will tell you that there is a curve where the person, as he continues to smoke within two to three decades, 
the, the time to getting into one of these absorption states is extremely like shrinking as you know the person continues to get exposed to the smog. And so this kind of becomes a forecast in, 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 in a sense, and now clinicians say that, yeah, you know, this matches our intuition is that the more and more the person is exposed to the environment where they're smoking, then the chances of them getting into uh, the terminal state with, you know, tumor developing the lungs is extremely high, and so the, the, the time will start shrinking. Now, of course, anybody in this room will stand up and say, oh, well, you know, you don't consider all the changes where, you know, a person may move from uh, a somewhat uh, reasonably less polluted city to Shanghai or Beijing or New Delhi and say, oh, well, you know, he continued to smoke even there. So, you know, the model doesn't really spike down here and then bring the person at a bigger risk. I agree, all of that is true, but at least for a, a simple pass in a population where the, the individual lives in the same city for 40, 50 years, uh, this model is getting close to what biologists think as, uh, you know, agrees with their known intuition. And so, in, in a sense, uh, we're getting closer to where we would like to be, although this kind of data still doesn't exist, but it is really helping the biologists and the oncologists to go write proposals and then collect this kind of data from uh, the real population. So, um, so with that said, uh, what we have actually done is uh, convinced our biology friends that game theory is something that they can also use in uh, in practical situations in their uh, in their diagnostics, um, and, uh, and 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 it does slightly better than machine learning because now we are actually tracking the signs and not just the numbers and uh, and, and the label, and uh, it's attracting the interest of our um, of our clinical friends. And it's still not a perfect model, as Professor Bill Sanders says, all models are wrong, some models make sense. So we are in one of those situations where this model is starting to make sense, and we hope to build this uh, as we get along. And I really want to thank uh, Professor Bashar for introducing me uh, game theory in biology when I took his class. I think it's one of the best classes around uh, that I have taken. And I also thank the uh, support of Kamjan Fellowship and uh, Dr. Winchelbaum, Wong, and Clary at Mayo Clinic, and all my fantastic group members at CSL. Thank you. We can take some questions from the audience. Uh, it is small, but um, you have to uh, you have to understand that this is a painful biopsy that people go through, and uh, not a whole lot of populations uh, you know sign up for these kind of studies where they have been exposed to the same condition for about 40, 50 years, or at least 20, 30 years. Uh, so this was the the data set that had the largest corpus, as I would call. Uh, there are a few uh, data that we have collected from uh, South Asia, I believe, Southeast Asia, but it has a lot of missing values and things, so we, we were not very confident in testing it. And it came from different sources. In this particular data, it was the same hospital, same set of oncologists who have done the entire uh, data collection, and they have a survey to make sure that, you know, these people were not under other kind of addictions and things like that. So it's a, it's a relatively clean data set to work with. But I... I think the model is fairly generic enough that we can start, you know, clubbing in more samples and trying to see how it works. So um, the, the curve that you showed earlier, mm -hmm. um, where you have the different probabilities of, of uh, expression, uh, different levels of expression, right? That's constructed with uh, with population data. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so um, the one thing that was, um, I don't want to give a very biology-heavy answer because it would really turn any, everybody down, but there are certain kinds of cancer cells and cancer genes that are in a particular phase where if they're in the stem cell sort of a marker zone, then they are genetically more highly predisposed to developing the tumor, as I said before. Uh, this population was specifically chosen where they were not carrying those specific mutations that were putting them at already a higher risk of developing tumor. So these were individuals who have not inherited any kind of, um, you know, uh, active mutant that will, you know, already put them at risk of developing tumor. These were hand-picked and cherry-picked to make sure that these were, 
purely because of the exposure to smog that they have developed the tumor. Um, but uh, from what, I, what the lung cancer community knows is that even if they were predisposed to getting that particular disease from the mutation that they were carrying, the odds are extremely low. Because we know a lot, there's this famous paradox, right, which is that most people lung cancer are smokers, but all smokers don't get lung cancer. So those are one of those unicorns, even if they carry the mutation, because the gene expression somehow balance out over time, they just don't get cancer, but they are at inherent risk of developing the tumor, but they don't get the tumor. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's a tricky situation for biologists to accept it. Um, and that's why they, they have these case and control studies where they kind of weed out these genetically predisposed disposed people uh, into making these studies. So that's my, as uh, you know, biologically less heavy answer as I can give. Um, so in this particular data that we had, um, uh, we all, so uh, I would say out of the 107 t test samples that we saw, uh, 104 of them had uh, NASH and PURE strategies. Uh, two of them didn't, and the two didn't because of the fact that these samples fitted in these distributions where, you know, it, they were on the borderline for, for both. Um, and so, um, so basically what it says is that if you correctly, if the, pop, if the individual correctly follows that of the population distribution, then more or less the strict NASH solution is the predictor in, in, uh, in knowing whether the sample is tumorous or not. And we have a reasonable theorem on that in the paper, but I think that's what game theory really gives us is if the individual is so close to the population's behavior, then the strict NASH solution more or less tells you what the individual will end up being. That, that's been our finding so far, and, uh, but it kind of biases the whole thing when you look at it in the Markov model where you, you want to have some probabilities and it doesn't give you such nice probabilities there. You also have, again, there, uh, battle of the sexes there. Yeah. There's two nasty Right. So in um, so the the thing is we don't know, but what we did was to pick the best uh, payoff that can explain the um, you know the, um, the, the 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 phenotype or the correlation to the observation that we find. Uh, but when we also picked at the Nashes, which were not the highest payoffs put together, uh, I think the prediction accuracies came down to about seventy percent. So it was not all that bad. But that's inherently because of this bias that we uh, that we introduce here, right? And that puts the individual's gene expressions in in, in a spot where, if it's truly uh, you know in, in the zone here where the individual is healthy, then it will push the model more and more and more close towards the healthy strategies. I hope I answered your question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the the so the thing is when you have multiple solutions, right? The question is, what do we pick? And then supposing I pick a solution, and if I want to know how much far it was from the other uh, Nash solutions. Uh, this ratio gives me a reasonable estimate of how much better was it compared to the other solutions in the in the game. Um, so here we have only two strategies, but you know a gene has more than two functions, and then you'll have as many more strategies as you could have in theory. And so this was this was the this was the simplest way I could explain this to our biology friends, saying that the solution was not all that bad, or this cherry picking was not all that bad. That's how I would put it. I mean, I'll have to come up with something better, but this was the, the simplest one. Thank you very much, Eric. With this, we conclude the last talk of the conference. I would like to thank the audience. And I would also would like to thank Professor Hayek for his great inspiration and support of this conference. He is the, actually the godfather of this conference. <laughs>
this year, interestingly, the conference have grown. We have this year the number of registrations, the registrants have tripled, and we also have four awards to be announced during dinner. So please join us for dinner in, this, in, in CSA, and you can follow anyone with the, with the conference logo, which was new this year too. <laughs>